Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Canon EOS 250D, or Rebel SL3 as it's known in North America. The 250D, as I'll refer to it in this review, is a compact DSLR aimed at photographers or vloggers buying their first interchangeable lens camera, but who want to start with a step up from entry level models. The kit costs £599 or 649 US dollars, and that gets you a small but well featured DSLR with a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, the choice of using an optical viewfinder or a fully articulated touchscreen, 1080p movies with great autofocus, 4K video with less good focus, Wi Fi with Bluetooth, a microphone input, and the EFS 18 55mm f4 5.6 STM zoom, and that's the lens that I've used for most of my tests in this video. The 250D is the successor to the EOS 200D or Rebel SL2 with the main difference being the latest Digicate processor which adds support for 4K video and eye detection in live view, both of which I'll talk about later in the video. The 250D is equipped with the same 24 megapixel APS-C sensor as its predecessor which employs Canon's excellent dual pixel CMOS autofocus for movies in live view, allowing it to smoothly and confidently refocus, at least for movies when you're filming in 1080p. Like all Canon bodies to date, there's no sensor stabilisation, with the 250D instead relying on optically stabilised lenses to iron out any wobbles. If you're filming video though, you can apply optional digital stabilisation, but at the cost of cropping the image. You can see this in action in my separate video all about vlogging with the 250D or SL3, so check that out if you're going to be using it for vlogging. It's easy to gloss over the lens mount on a budget DSLR, but Canon's EF mount gives the 250D access to one of the largest lens catalogues around, which crucially includes some very affordable options. One of the first lenses you should consider after the kit zoom is the EF 50mm f1.8 STM, ideal for portraits and exploring shallow depth of field effects with blurred backgrounds. It costs around £130 or dollars, much cheaper than equivalent native lenses for mirrorless systems, so if you're on a budget, it's definitely worth thinking about. If you're into vlogging or ultra-wide photography, the EFS 10-18mm is also cheaper than Canon's mirrorless equivalent. Meanwhile, the APS-C sensor reduces the field of view of all lenses by 1.6 times, so the 18-55mm kit zoom becomes equivalent to 29-88mm, while the 50mm prime I mentioned a minute ago becomes 80mm, which is perfect for portraits. As a DSLR, the 250D employs an optical viewfinder, and when using it the camera is limited to a basic 9-point autofocus system. The major benefit of an optical viewfinder over an electronic one is low battery consumption which allows the 250D to shoot up to 1000 images per charge, that's roughly three times more than when using the screen in live view. But unlike electronic viewfinders on mirrorless cameras, you won't be enjoying face or eye detection across the frame, the chance to preview effects like black and white, or the ability to film movies or playback images using the viewfinder. Now, it is of course a personal choice, but I much prefer trading battery life for the flexibility of electronic viewfinders, and when testing the 250D I rarely find myself using the optical viewfinder due to its inferior experience. If you enable live view, you can use the touchscreen for composition, allowing the camera to focus almost anywhere on the frame, as well as supporting face and eye detection. Canon's touch interface is one of the best around, letting you tap your way through the quick or main menu systems, swipe through images in playback, as well as double tapping or pinching to magnify. Like the 200D, the screen is side hinged and fully articulated, allowing it to flip out and twist to almost any angle. Great for composing at high or low angles, whether in the landscape or portrait orientation, as well as back on itself for protection or facing forward for selfies or vlogging. Canon continues to be one of the few companies to regularly fit fully articulated screens and the 250D becomes the smallest DSLR to feature one. As someone who films a lot of pieces to camera, I find them incredibly useful. At first glance, the top panel looks similar to the earlier 200D, but Canon simplified a couple of items. There's no longer a Wi-Fi button on the left side, while the flash off and creative auto modes have been dropped from the main dial. But you still have creative effects, scene presets and full auto, along with the traditional PASM options. Behind the clicky shutter release button is a finger dial, the only control wheel on the camera, along with ISO and DISP buttons and a rotary power switch which sets the camera for photos or movies. 
The ISO button is dedicated to sensitivity, but the disc button can be customised from turning the screen on and off to previewing the depth of field, firing up the Wi-Fi, maxing the screen brightness, or pausing movie autofocus. Bonus points for anyone who noticed something else missing from the top, the traditional large sync pin in the middle of the hot shoe. Like Canon's entry-level 2000D and 4000D models, this prevents the 250D from syncing with third-party lights and flashes which rely on that connection. Canon's own EX speed lights still work, but I think it's a bit mean to remove this pin, especially since it was present on the previous 200D, not to mention the M50. The 250D inherits the helpful guided interface of the 200D, which presents a bunch of common settings for each shooting mode, along with a slider for its core adjustment on the screen. So in program mode, the slider adjusts exposure compensation. In aperture priority, it adjusts the aperture. In shutter priority, it's the shutter speed. And in manual, it's the aperture and the shutter. And in each case, there's helpful icons telling you what effect the slider will have. Meanwhile, below the slider are icons for adjusting things like the drive and focusing modes. It's a helpful interface for exploring creative control, but it's easily switched for a more traditional info screen if you prefer. Round the back, the controls are the same as the 200D, including dedicated buttons for exposure compensation, AF area adjustment and live view. Behind a flap on the left side are ports for a remote cord and a 3.5mm microphone input, that mic input cementing its credentials as one of the best vlogging cameras for the money. On the right side are mini HDMI and micro USB ports, the USB doubling up for analog video output but sadly not able to charge the battery internally, while the HDMI port now offers a clean output if desired in 1080 or 4K resolution. I think this is probably Canon's cheapest camera to offer that. Speaking of the battery, the 250D is powered by the same LP E17 pack as its predecessor, although if you're using the optical viewfinder, Canon reckons you can now squeeze up to 1000 shots per charge. Switch to live view and you're looking at around 300, although both figures remain an increase over the 200D. In terms of movies, I was able to film 3 hours worth of 1080p video across 6 clips on a single charge before the icon started to flash. Meanwhile, the battery compartment is also where you'll find the SD memory card slot. The 250D may lack the physical wireless button of the 200D, but the capabilities remain the same. A low power Bluetooth connection keeps your phone connected with the camera, automatically embedding GPS coordinates as you shoot if desired, and supporting a simple but responsive remote control button in the app to shoot photos or movies. If you prefer remote control with full live view or to wirelessly transfer images or videos, the Bluetooth can also configure a faster Wi-Fi connection for you. There may be nothing new here, but Canon's wireless implementation remains one of the easiest and most capable around. In terms of autofocus, there's a basic 9-point system concentrated in a diamond pattern if you're shooting through the viewfinder, or dual pixel CMOS AF in live view which works across most of the frame and also supports face detection, now with the option to additionally enable eye detection. Here's a burst taken through the viewfinder using the full 9-point array and continuous servo AF. So long as the subject falls under one of the 9 AF points, the camera can do a fair job at keeping it in focus, and the top burst speed here is 5 frames per second. Switch the camera to live view, and again not only can it focus across more of the frame, but also deploy face detection now with optional eye detection too if desired. Burst speed slowed down in live view, but the broader focusing area and features will make it more desirable for many. Now here are the actual frames that I took while shooting that burst through the viewfinder a moment ago. And what's striking here is that while the camera's focusing has found me in most frames, the metering wasn't clever enough to identify a face and is exposed for the backlit background rather than yours truly. The result are a bunch of underexposed shots. In stark contrast, here's the burst when shooting in live view, where face detection, at least when I'm close enough, not only told the camera where to focus, but also what to meter on. As a result, the camera's correctly focused and exposed for me while ignoring the bright background. This is what you expect from a modern camera in 2019, but for the most foolproof operation, you'll need to shoot with the 250D screen in live view, rather than using the optical viewfinder, which makes you kind of wonder if a fully electronic mirrorless version, like the EOS M50, wouldn't be a better bet. The 250D has a silent drive mode option, although like other DSLRs, it can't help but make some noise as the mirror and shutter open and close. Here's how it sounds. 
Returning to the drive menu, I'll switch it back to the normal shutter now for comparison. So silent mode is quieter, but it's not silent by any means, is it? For true silence, you need an electronic shutter option in live view as provided by most mirrorless cameras. Moving on to image quality, here's a bunch of JPEGs I shot out of camera using the EFS 18-55mm f4-5.6 STM kit zoom. The 250D combines the 24 megapixel APS-C sensor of its predecessor with the company's latest Digic 8 processor and delivers natural looking JPEGs using the default settings. 14-bit RAW files are also available for those who like to tweak and doing so certainly unlocks the chance to retrieve details in shadows and highlights, not to mention a just sharpening to taste, but I was personally very satisfied by the default output from the camera for general day-to-day -day use. Moving on to video, the EOS 250D can film 720 at 50 or 60p, 1080 at 25, 30, 50 or 60p, and in an upgrade over its predecessor, you can now film 4K at 24 or 25p, but sadly there's no high speed video for slow motion. In any mode, the maximum clip length is a second shy of half an hour, but there are a number of limitations to be aware of. First is the removal of 1080p video at 24p, a mode offered on the 200D and M50 when set to NTSC video, but strangely absent here, not to mention on the EOS RP. What's going on, Canon? 4K is available at 24p when set to NTSC, but as you'll discover, it's not always desirable to film in this mode and simply down convert to 1080 in post. Here's a clip filmed in 1080 at 25p where the EOS 250D uses the full sensor width and can deploy the confident dual pixel autofocus system which you'll see in action in just a moment. Now here's the 250D filming in 4K where the camera employs a rather severe crop of around 1.56 times. Believe it or not this clip was filmed at the exact same focal length as the earlier 1080 clip. To compare their quality, I adjusted the zoom for the 4K clip to match the field of view and have put 1080 in the top half of the screen and 4K in the bottom. The 4K is definitely more detailed, but the crop means you'll need a very short focal length for wide views or vlogging. Now back to 1080 video for a demonstration of Canon's dual pixel CMOS AF in action, here using the touchscreen to pull focus back and forth. The kit lens didn't make it a big challenge this time, but believe me, it still works a treat even with lenses sporting a very shallow depth of field. Now for the same task in 4K, with the lens adjusted to match the field of view of the previous clip. Again, when filming in 4K, the 250D loses dual pixel AF and instead relies on a more basic contrast-based system, which on the 250D is visibly less confident in this test. The 250D supports face and now also eye detection in movies and when filming in 1080 does a good job at keeping the subject in focus. This clip was filmed with the kit zoom. For a bigger challenge, here's the camera fitted with the EF 50mm f1.8 STM wide open at f1.8 and while the focusing on this particular lens is a little more leisurely, you can still see it tracks me successfully if I slow down or pause from time to time. The bottom line is you can trust Canon's face detection to find and focus on you when filming, which is invaluable for one-person video creators or vloggers. How about face tracking in 4K? Well, here's the 250D back with the kit zoom filming in 4K, where again you suffer a large crop and lose the confident dual pixel AF, a result that is much less decisive. In fact, it rarely manages to keep up with my movement at all here. The 4K crop also accentuates skewing from the rolling shutter as I move in and out of the frame. Now your mileage may vary but I think for most videographers the 4K on the 250D suffers from too many limitations to make it practical for anything other than static subjects like buildings or landscapes. In this respect it's exactly the same as the EOS M50 and like that model I think it's best to think of the 250D as mainly a 1080p camera with bonus 4K if you can make it work for you. Just before wrapping up, a quick note on vlogging. Here's a clip I filmed with the 250D and the kit zoom in 1080p, which is part of a separate video I've made showcasing the vlogging features on this camera, so do check it out if you're intending to use it for vlogging. In short though, the 250D is perfect for vlogging with its flip screen, microphone input, and great face tracking autofocus, at least in 1080p. Switch it to 4K and the crop means you'll really want to fit the wider EFS 10 to 18 mm STM zoom and even then you'll have a less confident AF system to worry about. The bottom line is it may be very capable for 1080p vlogging but there's little here you can't get on the M50 or indeed the 200D if you're happy filming in 1080. 
Meanwhile, if you do want these kind of confident autofocus capabilities, but filming in 4K without a crop, I'm afraid you're going to have to spend more, getting on for about $1,000 or pounds for something like a Fujifilm X-T30 or Sony A6400. The Canon EOS 250D, or Rebel SL3 as it's known in North America, continues the premise of its predecessors. A compact and affordable body that's a step up over the cheapest models, while delivering what should be the best of both worlds, with a traditional DSLR optical viewfinder and a thoroughly modern live view experience with a fully articulated touchscreen. The 24 megapixel sensor delivers good quality photos and video. The combination of a flip screen, mic input and confident focusing, at least when filming in 1080p anyway, makes it perfect for vlogging. And the wireless connectivity is among the best of its rivals. It's a compelling package for the money, but all of this was present on its predecessor, the 200D or Rebel SL2. The major upgrade here is the presence of 4K, but in true Canon style it's limited with a severe crop, less confident autofocus and more visible rolling shutter. I can't imagine many people filming with it in 4K very often. The addition of eye detection is also nice, but it really should have been there all along. And it's also important to mention a couple of useful features that have actually been removed on this model. 1080 video is no longer available at 24p, while the central sync pin on the hot shoe is now missing, preventing or at least limiting the use of third party flashes. Both are features that are present on the earlier 200D SL2 and the EOS M50. Since the 4K is so limited, there's nothing particularly compelling to recommend the 250D over the 200D. And indeed, if you're into non-canon flashes or filming in 24p, there's actually compelling reasons to go for the older model instead. But like the 200D, I was struck how the traditional DSLR respects, the optical viewfinder and the 9.0 AF system actually felt like its weakest points in practice. The viewfinder size, like all cheaper DSLRs, is small and basic compared to electronic viewfinders, and of the 9 AF points, only the center one felt confident tracking action or operating in low light. While the optical viewfinder definitely has the advantage of extending battery life and being easy to use on the screen in bright light, I still prefer shooting with a 250D in live view where I could focus using almost the entire frame, deploy face detection and a more reliable exposure metering, along with composing at any angle with the fully articulated touchscreen. The 250D quite simply comes to life when shooting in live view and to me feels held back when using the optical viewfinder. Two years on from reviewing the 200D, I was also surprised and struck by how many times I raised the viewfinder to my eye after taking a photo to try and play it back, only to remember that this of course isn't possible on the DSLR. Since the best experience with the 250D relies on having its mirror raised, I personally feel a mirrorless version simply makes more sense, and Canon offers just that with the similarly priced EOS M50. They share a similar feature set, but the M50 is a tad smaller while swapping the optical viewfinder for an electronic one. Sure, it consumes more power than an optical viewfinder, but you can use it to preview effects, exploit a wealth of guides and focusing or exposure assistance, film movies and play back both photos and video. I realize this is a very personal choice, but to me, the benefits of an optical viewfinder are minimal on a budget DSLR. And now in 2019, it just feels kind of old fashioned to me. In conclusion, the EOS 250D or Rebel SL3 is a fine camera that offers a lot for a relatively low price, but there's minimal benefit over its predecessor and in fact the loss of a couple of useful features. So if you're smitten with an optical viewfinder and believe a DSLR remains the way forward for you, I'd compare prices very carefully with the older 200D or SL2 and look out for bargains. As time goes on though, any price difference, not to mention availability, may erode, making the latest model the default choice. If, however, you've decided the DSLR aspects of the 250D actually hold it back, then embrace the benefits of mirrorless and go for something more modern like Canon's EOS M50. It shares a similar feature set and price to the 250D, but with fully electronic composition with the screen and the viewfinder, which to me simply delivers a better experience at this price point. Right, that's the end of this video, so if you found it useful, please give it a like, and I'd love it if you subscribe to my channel too, as it really helps it grow. As always, if you really enjoyed it, you can treat me to a coffee, or treat yourself to my in-camera book, and there's links to both in the description and pinned comment below, as well as one to check prices on the 250D or SL3. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.